So among all the religions and philosophies, how do we know Christianity is true? While there are many ways to address the question, let's begin by saying that Christianity makes sense of the world around us. In other words, it presents the most correct worldview based on the world in which we live. There are three worldviews that lie at the foundation of all religions and philosophies. It's known as theism, naturalism, and pantheism. Theism teaches there is a personal God who created the universe. Naturalism teaches there is no divine being and that the universe is the result of time and chance. Pantheism teaches that the universe is eternal and that the divine is an impersonal force made up of all things. All three worldviews cannot be true at the same time, and if one of them is true, then the other two must be false. The evidence points towards theism. I will only go over three lines of evidence for this claim for the sake of time. First is the argument for the first cause or the cosmological argument, which states if something exists, it must have either come from something else, come from nothing, or have always existed. What is the most reasonable conclusion of the three for the existence of the universe? Scientists confirm that the universe has a beginning, many call this the Big Bang. Since the universe assuredly has a beginning, the worldview of pantheism bears the burden of proof. Second, to say the universe comes from nothing goes against reasonable scientific inquiry and human logic. For example, any invention in human history is not brought about from nothing. It comes from materials and ingenuity that existed before its inception. Therefore, the naturalist worldview has no logical ground to stand on. They may invoke a multiverse theory or a singularity before the Big Bang argument, but once again, those theories would also need a first cause to exist. So it is only a regression. The best conclusion is that the universe is the result of a cause greater than itself, and that cause is God. Second, we have the proof of design or the teleological argument. Complexity and design point to a designer. For example, although all the parts of a watch are found on the earth, no one would assume it evolved as a result of natural unguided actions of chance. Why would we conclude otherwise when we look at the human brain or the human anatomy, which is much more complex? The more we discover about the universe and nature, the more we realize how unlikely it is that this could have all happened by accident. Therefore, the burden of proof is on the worldviews of naturalism and pantheism, which holds to a position of evolution. And finally, we have the moral argument. All people have a sense of right and wrong. In every culture, adultery, murder and stealing are wrong. Where does this universal sense of right come from? A moral law code requires a moral lawgiver who is personal and reflects the moral law in his character. Since we are made in God's image, we reflect his moral law. C.S. Lewis stated, As an atheist, my argument against God was that the universe seemed so cruel and unjust. But how had I got this idea of just and unjust? A man does not call a line crooked unless he has some idea of a straight line. What was I comparing this universe with when I called it unjust? Naturalists and pantheists have a difficulty accounting for the human conscience. For these reasons, theism is the only possible worldview that can remain true to scientific and philosophical scrutiny. So now that we have established a theistic worldview, why Christianity? The answer is threefold. First, Christianity is only as true as the person of Jesus Christ. He fulfilled prophecies, claimed to be God in the flesh, performed many miracles, died and physically rose from the dead. Christianity is about Jesus, His claims and His deeds. It is based on Him and it is only as true as He is true. Second, Christianity is consistent with reason, facts and shows evidence of God's inspiration in the Bible. Third, all other religion systems are either unverifiable or irrational in their teachings. The first thing I would like to do is before I begin addressing each point individually is to make an important distinction between Christianity and other religions. Christianity is about a relationship with God that is achieved by God Himself and based on trust, also known as faith. A Christian does not work to get to God because God has done it all. A Christian lives a life of trust in God who has already saved him. In this sense, it is not a religion but more a relationship. So let's begin with the first point, the person of Jesus Christ. Among all men who ever lived, Jesus stands apart from each one. Throughout the Gospels, Jesus claimed himself to be God. He claimed to have authority over the law, creation, sin and death. In John 10 verse 30 it states, I and my Father are one. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. 
Jesus answered him, Many good works have I showed you from my Father, for which of those works do you stone me? The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, and because that thou, being man, makest thyself God. The Jewish enemies of Christ clearly understood his claims, and it is for this reason they killed him. His disciples also understood his claim and presented it in their message. Not only did he make an extraordinary claim, Jesus confirmed it. There are numerous ways in which Christ proved these claims. I will cover only three. The first confirmation of Jesus' claims is his sinless life. Jesus' most intimate companions stated he committed no sin that he needed to repent of. Paul writes of Christ in 2 Corinthians 5 verses 21. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. It would have been hypocritical of Jesus if he had indeed sinned and never repented, for he taught all men this principle. Even his enemies could find no sin in him. Pontius Pilate, after examining Jesus, stated to the angry mob, I find no basis for a charge against him. The Bible declares God is holy, and Jesus showed himself to be holy as well. The second confirmation is the miracles he performed. God's existence makes it reasonable to assume he would use miracles to confirm his message. Miracles are a powerful confirmation because it authenticates the Creator's authority over his creation. Christ's miracles over nature, sickness, spiritual forces, sin and death display this authority over every realm of creation. The third confirmation is the fulfilled prophecies. Before Jesus set foot on earth, there were over 300 prophecies made by the Old Testament writers about the Messiah. The prophecies include the city of birth, his method of execution, his betrayal, and the date of his death, etc. Jesus fulfilled each of these. The probability of fulfilling just eight of these by chance is mathematically zero. No one has both made the claims of Christ and confirmed them as he did. Jesus further confirmed his claims to be God by rising from the dead. Jesus openly proclaimed that as God, he had authority over life and death. He states in John 11 verse 25, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. The resurrection is proof that his claim is true. Many skeptics have presented alternative theories to the resurrection However, these arguments have been shown to be severely flawed and could not account for all the facts surrounding the events of the resurrection. Many have done detailed analysis of the evidence and have concluded that the resurrection must be a historical event. The late Simon Greenleaf, the former royal professor of law at Harvard, performed one of the most famous of these studies. In his book, The Testimony of the Evangelist, the Gospels Examined by the Rules of Evidence, he concluded, they had every possible motive to review carefully the grounds of their faith and the evidences of the great facts and truths which they asserted. It was therefore impossible that they could have persisted in affirming the truths they have narrated had not Jesus actually risen from the dead, and had they not known this fact as certainly as they knew any other fact. As an atheist lawyer and journalist, Lee Strobel did a two-year investigation on the resurrection, interviewing some of the great scholars on both sides. He finally concluded in his book, The Case for Christ, In light of the convincing facts I had learned during my investigation, in the face of this overwhelming avalanche of evidence in The Case for Christ, the great irony was this. It would require much more faith for me to maintain my atheism than to trust in Jesus of Nazareth. No one has been able to conquer death by raising himself or herself from the dead. Jesus, by his resurrection, proved he is God. For only God, the giver of life, has the authority over life and death. Since Jesus substantiates his claims, we conclude he is divine and what he teaches is true and authoritative. Jesus also taught the Bible to be God's word. Therefore, the Bible is the foundation for all truth to all of mankind, in every culture and for all time. Any teaching that is contrary to those of Jesus and the Bible are false. The second point is reason. Facts of History and Inspiration There is nothing within the scope of Christian teaching that denies reason. The doctrine of the Trinity may be a mystery, but it's not illogical. The Incarnation may be paradoxical in that the person of Jesus is both divine and human, but it's not impossible. The Resurrection of Christ may be enigmatic, but it does not defy logic. 
Christianity is reasonable. That is, it does not violate logic. It may contain mysteries and paradoxes, but there is nothing within its body of teaching that contradicts reason. There is nothing within the Christian teaching that denies the facts of history. History and archaeology confirm the Bible. We have many non-biblical accounts of New Testament events and people. Josephus, a Jewish historian between AD 37 and AD 101, mentioned John the Baptist and Herod, as well as Jesus and James. Tacitus, a Roman historian between AD 55 and AD 117, mentions Jesus. Thales mentions the eclipse of the sun when Jesus was crucified. The facts of archaeology and history support the Bible and do not contradict it. Various cities mentioned in it have been discovered, like Arad, Bethel, Ephesus, Gaza, Hezbon, Jericho, Nineveh, etc. The Hittites have been verified, as have the stables of Solomon, etc. The point is, there is nothing in archaeology that contradicts biblical truth. It agrees with and is consistent with archaeology and history. The evidence of biblical inspiration can be clearly seen in the prophecies found in the Old Testament and their fulfillment in the New Testament. But of course, there are critics who say that the Bible was altered to make it look as though Jesus fulfilled prophecies. But this would mean the Bible was purposely written to be a deception. What evidence exists for that claim? How do the critics account for the Bible's declaration of teaching truth while it is based on a lie? Why would the disciples knowingly deceive and suffer ostracization from their culture and be willing to die for what they knew was false? Such basic questions would need to be answered because those who would propose a new theory need to answer the tough questions that their theories would raise. Can they give a more reasonable explanation than the one contained in the Bible that Jesus was who we said he is and did what the scriptures say he did? If no more feasible theories can be proposed that would account for all the facts, then the critics have nothing on which to stand, and the claims of scripture are true. Lastly, other belief systems are unverifiable or irrational. There are other belief systems that claim to be valid, but they are either non-verifiable historically or irrational internally. For example, Mormonism clearly contradicts the Bible. It teaches God was a man on another planet and is married to a goddess wife, etc. It has no historical evidence to validate the Book of Mormon and teaches the logical impossibility of an internal regression of causes. It teaches that there is an infinite regression of gods being formed, i.e. an infinite list of causes in the past. But this is impossible since this would require crossing an infinite amount of time to get to the present. But an infinite amount of time cannot be crossed, otherwise it isn't infinite. Therefore, there cannot be an infinite regression of new gods being formed and Mormonism cannot be true. The religion of Islam teaches that the Quran is the absolute truth revealed from their God Allah. It further states, and this is critical, that if one fact in the Quran is incorrect, then Islam is not true. But the Quran teaches a man's seed come from his chest, not testes, in Quran 86 verses 5 to 7. The sun sets in murky water in Quran 18 verse 86. The moon was split in two in Quran 54 verse 1. It says that birds and ants can talk in Quran 27 verse 16 and 27 verse 18. Since these are not true, Islam cannot be either. Atheism as a negative worldview cannot be validated to be true, nor can it account for rationality since its materialistic perspective cannot bridge the gap between absolute conceptual realities, i.e. logical absolutes on which reason is based, and the principle of materialism that all things in the universe can be understood in terms of motion, matter, chemical reactions, etc. Again, atheism cannot be verified as being true since it is a position of negativity. A denial of the existence of something is almost always impossible to validate. Reincarnation religions, Hinduism, Buddhism, etc. have the problem of karma, the residual cause and effect from previous lives that govern future incarnation levels. These incarnations serve the goal of teaching the soul through life's journeys so that they can return to the divine source. But each soul had at its initial incarnation perfect karma Yet each soul failed to return to the source even while having had perfect karma. Instead, each soul is locked in an ongoing cycle of reincarnation. If the soul had not learned its lessons after experiencing perfect karma, how can it do so with imperfect karma? Furthermore, 
Eastern-based religions deny the absolutes of logic and infer counter-logical systems that contradict logic and cannot be validated through history or reason. In essence, they are unfalsifiable. The New Age movement offers subjective, unverifiable experience as the underlying framework for its theological perspectives such as human divinity, divinity of nature, etc. It is an eclectic movement with numerous contradictory belief systems that rest under its broad umbrella. I don't know how anyone can take it seriously. These simplified and brief analysis of various systems demonstrate that their claims must be verifiable in some way, archaeology, ancient documents concurrent with verifiable history, etc., and must be rational. But when a theological system cannot be verified using either normal historical examination or internal logical consistency, how can it be assumed to be true? It cannot. Since no one else has anything better to offer than Jesus, and since no one else has fulfilled prophecies, performed miracles, raised people from the dead, risen from the dead, and promised to return for his people, then we are forced by reason and the evidence to continue to believe in Jesus, his teachings, and the truth that Christianity represents as it is found in him. Christianity is consistent with reason, facts, and shows evidence of God's inspiration. And finally, all other religion systems are either unverifiable or irrational, thereby disqualifying them as being true. Therefore, it is reasonable to conclude that Christianity is true.